For our first interview of 2016, we have a slightly different format and a new location. We're here at the newly refurbished sampling lounge above the historic cigar store James J. Fox in St. James's in London. And I'd like to welcome Nick Barker and Halil Osman, uh, who work here at the store. Now, this is the oldest cigar store in the world, uh, opened in 1787 and was the cigar store of Sir Winston Churchill and Oscar Wilde, amongst others. And we're here to interview Nick and Halil because they are two of the store's three masters of Habanos. And we're here to talk a little about the grueling process they went through to, to gain this, uh, uh, this coveted award. So, gentlemen, let's just start a little with, uh, with how you started in the, uh, in the industry. Nick, how did you, you start in, uh, in cigars? Solely by chance. Okay. Uh, uh, back in 2002, I came across an ad for it in the Evening Standard. I had very little idea what to expect, but um, once um, I got offered the job and once I got into it, I became uh, passionate towards cigars very quickly. Um, I'd say in the first year or so in the trade, I probably smoked 100, 150 different cigars and make notes on each one and really wanted to explore this that bit better. I think to the point where these days where I meet a lot of guys the sort of age I was when I started in the trade, um, it, it's a pleasure to be able to give them a little bit of a shortcut to find what they like rather than them have to go through so much, so much, so much to get to know themselves in the process. It's, Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Although some people might not consider that too hard work going through. There are worse things cigars. you could do. There are. <laughs> and Halil, how did, you, uh, how did you come to cigars? I started in the industry in 2004. Um, my dad often smoked Cuban cigars and some handmade cigars. And I was very interested in the industry as well. Um, what I found is I was a similar age to Nick when I started as well. Um, and I often wanted to experiment <coughs> with cigars as well. Um, and I wanted to see why my dad enjoyed smoking cigars so much. Um, and that's how I got around starting. Got it. Got it. And then we move on to the... the, to the let, let's talk now about the, the Master of Habana. So each of you are proudly wearing on your lapel, this, uh, the, the, the little badge that marks you out as a, as a master of Habanos. Um, a little, t talk a little about what, what, uh, what started you, why you started to, to consider the exam, what made you want to go and do the exam? I think it was a, a very important aspect for our job to be able to have an extra qualification that was highly recognised in the industry. It's also something that I'm very proud of to have and the reason for that is I feel I'm still very young, I still can develop my skills further and that gives me much more confidence in serving the customer having this qualification. I can back up my, um, my theories and with knowledge and everything that I've learned towards that. And the customers appreciate the extra knowledge of um, fermentations, brandings um, and extra background information that they may have not known before we pass this exam. Got it. And Nick, just, just jump in a little bit. When, when people come into the store, and do they do they know? Do customers know when they see the badge actually w they, what they it do. means? They, they often do. Um, sometimes they don't, and they ask. Uh, right. However, at the time of passing, and I'm sure it was a case with Halil um, just as much so. Um, it was quite well documented on social media, you know, on on, on our on our pages, um, the official JJ Fox pages, and whatnot. Right. Um, so I had a lot of people say, "I know what what exactly is it you had to do to pass this?" And they ask questions about the exam and often uh, people will ask if uh, much tasting was involved and there's actually no <laughs> tasting involved in the exam whatsoever as oh. a little pointed out it's all it's all theoretical right. it's as much as anything required of you as a professional to have an entire agricultural and technical overview of the product um, of every process behind it and um, a good insight into the industry and the market itself got it got it and what did you, so what did you do, Nick? What did you do to start to prepare for taking the exam? How did you, how did you kick off your, your uh, studies? Um, well, funny enough, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people about this, and I, I've spoken to a lot of people who have, have passed it. I understand there are 24 uh, who have passed it now, and I've spoken to about half of them, and other people seem to have found 
areas more difficult than myself and and the other way around in regard to say the sizes the vitolas of the cigars so the uh, vitola de galera and the vitola de salida both the factory and sale names this is something i've always had an interest in because i like the little stories behind why something is called this one right. i always points out for this little cigar the um demitas from el rey de mundo quite literally translates to between acts it was considered to fit a 15 minute interval at the theater so it was made somewhat with that in mind right i always like these little stories behind those so i always had something to link directly to those and i just found that interesting it was the agricultural side of things um, quite literally from the ground up which i found very difficult to get my head around for a while so it was very much a case of repetition and drilling it in essentially you know just uh, reading 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 and i have to say from my point of view, because I'm not working in the industry all day, every day, when I look at what's required, mm. it's the it's learning the different cigar sizes and the, the ring gauges mm. and, the, and the lengths that I find most daunting, having been such a long time since I ever did any proper studying like, like that. Um, how long did it take you, Halil, to, to, from, from the point you started to the point where you felt you were ready to actually go and do the exam? Uh, honestly, Nick, I think it was about three months. Okay. Um, I, I, I would say that no matter how long you've been working with cigars, I feel like you still have to really prepare for the exam. There's nothing that can prepare you for certain questions. Um, as my colleague Nick was saying, there's a lot of stuff that we never used to really talk about, and which was the agricultural side, which is a great background into how cigars are actually produced. Right. And that was one bit of the cigar industry that I didn't have much knowledge on. Right. But since this passing of this exam, I still do. I have it now. Okay. And did you both do the exam at the same sort of time? We didn't, no. Nick took it uh, previous to myself. Uh, I think you took it six months before. About six months Six so months before. before yeah. um, I passed it in 2014, okay. in November. Right. So did, were you, did you sort of help each other and test each other when you were, when you were getting ready? Um, because you? I took it first, I, I gave a little a few, um, a few tips as to what to expect. Uh -huh. Because going into it myself, I didn't realise um, uh, fully so exactly how much of it is based around um, the, 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 the procedures with, in regard to growing the whole agricultural aspect of things. It's very much 50% um, of the exam. Right. At right. least, you know, so... Um, there's a lot to prepare yourself for there, which, as Halil alluded to, you wouldn't necessarily know unless you looked it up. Because our knowledge as, um, as a cigar salesman, more than anything, is based on what's useful and what is interesting to the customer. And we're very rarely questioned on this side of it. Right. So right. that was something to become a lot more thorough in. Um, um, I made it clear to Halil that they really do expect that from you, and he applied himself no, accordingly. No. <laughs> good, good. So then you arrive on the day... Mm. And you're faced with, to start with, uh, a number of actually sort of a, a cl an examination situation. Actually sitting down and running through, as I understand it, uh, true or false questions, uh, some brief answers, some multiple <coughs> choices, and then a a page of with a, a prices mm. and details of cigars with ten uh, mistakes in. H how did you find the the the, uh, the written exam, Halil? How how was that for you? I mean, a lot of people say when people speak about multiple choice and true or false, they'll often say, oh, but you've got a one in two chance. It's not a forgiving way to do an exam. Mm. It's actually you have to really read through the question and you have to really thoroughly understand the question to be able to give an accurate answer. Now, with the mistakes of the menu, again, there is you have to be extremely thorough with the cigar sizes extremely far with the the, uh, the packaging it comes in and there, and all aspects of the cigar industry you have to be aware of right right it it, 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 it sounds incredibly daunting and I I don't know whether anybody else has done this I have on the hunters and Frank our website and mm. we'll put a, a link on mm. the article there is a there's a selection of 10 or, or 20 questions on the hunters website which is well worth going on and testing yourself just to find out no, just in a very small way, how hard the, the exam is. What, did you find any particular aspects more difficult than others in the written exam, Nick? 
I, I have found the uh, questions on the website to be rather more forgiving. Oh, really? Uh, than in the okay. exam. <laughs> oh, I've got no hope then. Um, I think but I it, it, it's, about it's a very or forty percent. When I do that. <laughs> it, it's a good idea as far as what to expect, though. Right. Um, as far as uh, the, the the four written modules, um, I, like Alil said, as as far as true or false is concerned, and the idea of it being you've got fifty percent chance of getting it right. It, it, they're, they're worded in a, in a way which require you to definitely know. Right. You know, I'm not saying as such it's designed to catch you out, but it's designed to test you. Yeah. Um, it's difficult, and, and it's meant to be difficult. So it's yeah. a multiple choice. You know, uh, m most of those choices in those questions are, are quite plausible answers. There's, there's never one that stands out as, oh, no, 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 no. And the mistakes in the menu is, uh, I, I quite enjoy that. I, I like this sort of thing. This is the sort of thing I've, I've set for you know, new members of staff to give them an idea as far as how much you need to remember training wise because you'll, you'll have the name of the cigar, the, the year it came out, if it was a, a limited or a regional um, or man, one manner of one off production. Oh. Um, as Halil said, the packaging it came in and uh, the exact Vitola. So it's, it's, it's designed to be able to catch you out in some aspects in a number of ways. Got it. And then you finished your, uh, you finished your, uh, your written exams mm. and then what uh, I've uh, I've heard people describe as the by far the most daunting aspect of it, the practical exam. So hello, just just describe for those who don't know about it what you actually have to do in the practical exam. Um, there's nothing that can prepare you for the practical exam. You go in completely <coughs> blind. Um, you don't know what to expect. You there is ten different cigars, and from these ten different cigars, you will have to give three factual points about each of the cigars. Now, I like to say I have quite a good knowledge of cigars due to being in the industry for t around 12 years now. And I nearly came unstuck a couple of times. And having the board of directors from Hunters there makes you a little bit nervy as well. A little. A little nervy, nervy. <laughs> yes, a little nervy. Um, so just, you've got three board directors from Hunters and Frankel sitting watching you do this. Exactly. And they are judging you. And boy, it is tough. So you've got, Nick, you've got a, a, a scenario in front of you, as I understand it. So you've got sort of a husband and wife at dinner. Is that how it, how it worked when you did it? Pretty much. Mine was a, a wedding okay. scenario. Um, I can't remember exactly the three questions uh, put forth by the, the customer. Right. The, 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 the customer. Um, but one of them was a wedding scenario, and I, I thought it obviously wiser to recommend a box of 25, considering that's roughly the amount of um, guests that the chap expected would smoke. Right. Cigars in tubes and a, a fairly small size, because when you have a box of cigars open, everyone becomes a cigar smoker. Right. And not everyone wants to smoke it straight away, so it's, it, it's sensible to recommend as such. But having 10 different cigars laid out right. is, is certainly one thing, and making three, three points... Uh, is, is certainly another, but you have to be careful not to prevent the points from becoming from, from remaining unique. You right. know, it's it's not doable to just look at the date under each box and say, right. well, this is from August two thousand and six, and this is from two thousand and nine. But this so. scenario is something that you weren't prepared for. You walk into the room, you're not prepared no. for a wedding or anything like that. It's all, it, it, it's, it's all not announced until you're there. Wow. Um, you, you know, there's going to be ten cigars, and you don't know which cigars they'll be. Um, I didn't even know which directors would be in there. Right. Um, and, until the time. Uh, yeah, it's just extraordinary. And so you went through the written exam, you went through the practical exam, and then you were told that you'd pass. How did you, how did you feel when you, when you passed a little? How, how was that? Uh, I felt ecstatic. I thought all my hard, hard work really paid off. Uh -huh. uh, really happy, really proud to finally be in an exclusive club of uh, Master of Havanos. Um, it was great because I was going to get some cigars to smoke. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I was going to be really proud to have the badge. It's something that's very important. I find it very important. And it is a morale booster to know that you are doing something right. And there is a future in the industry. Um, even though there is a lot of um, restrictions and so on, there is a future. Excellent. And Nick, so you, went, you, you when you've passed, you get the badge, of course. The, your you do indeed, your yeah. badge of office. The, the, and a, the and a box of cigars. Yeah, and a box of so. cigars and a, a, sort of a, a, a certificate. Right. Just to document your passing, of course, as well as the, the badge being a, a physical document in itself to, 
to show what you've um, yeah. actually uh, applied yourself to to earn that. Excellent. And I, I, I should point out at this point just how hard it is. Through, I think it's two or three years the exam's been going, there are only 24 people who've actually passed the exam, of whom 22 are still working in the, uh, in the industry in the UK. And 14 of those are working in stores and hotels, so uh, in lounges. So they're the people that, that you'd see. The rest are working in private members clubs, so the, the general public wouldn't actually get to see them. And the pass rate, I'm told, is uh, about 50%. Mm. Um, so it just shows, with all the preparation and the work that you did, and I'm sure everybody else ha does, how hard it is to get through. It's by no means a, a foregone conclusion that, uh, that you're going to do that. So the customers, the customers, the customers recognise, to a certain extent, the badge, or, 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 or do most customers understand what, what it's about? A fair amount of people do. A lot of people ask what it is. I think they, they see the word Havana on there. It says Masters of, Master of Havana Cigars. Yeah. Havana is in large letters, and they ask what it's for. And They always seem very interested when you explain to them um, what we've just spoken about, about the exam, what, what it entails, and what's expected of you, and um, how many people have passed it. You know, it's, it's still quite a small club, so it's an honour to be part of it. Yeah, it certainly is. So, let's just talk. We're going to move on and do the, uh, the, uh, the, final, uh, the final three questions that we always finish with. But for, before we do, let's just talk a little about where we are. So, we're in the newly refurbished sampling lounge above uh, Fox's store in, uh, at 19 St. James's Street. Um, just tell us a little, define for us, Hanel, just define sampling, because it is very important, because people don't smoke cigars up here, do they? They sample. They are sampling. Now, sampling is something that's very important and something that we have to vigorously enforce. Now, the way that sampling works is a person is coming into our store. They may want to buy a box of cigars, but they may need to try the cigar before. And this is where this f facility is very good for us. This is where the facility works extremely well it works in the sense that someone doesn't feel obligated to buy a box of cigars and they won't go home and they won't enjoy it they have the opportunity to try that single piece another thing about sampling is you can't buy a packet of machine made cigars and smoke them up here we have to be able to sell them in single increments so when we split a box of 25 handmaids or a box of 10 regionals or a box of 10 limited editions that's when we can allow sampling on the premises in this lovely new sampling lounge. Yeah, and it, I mean it, the the point is you wouldn't sit down and buy, you wouldn't buy a box of uh, a, a case of wine or anything li mm. like that unless you sampled it. You wouldn't pay four or five hundred pounds for a case of wine. So it, mm. it it works in the same way. And so Nick, the lounge, tell us a little. How how's the re what's happened here in terms of refurbishment in the, in the last uh, six nine months? It's been a drastic refurbishment. Um, a major refurbishment has just gone down very, very well with our customers. Um, partly uh, down to the fact that it's more than doubled in size. Right. We used to have uh, an amount of our offices up here, and we had a corridor leading from this door off, off to where the, uh, the, the toilets are. Right. Uh, but now it's the entire top floor. Okay. Uh, the, what, one major concern in advance, seemingly, from an amount of our customers was that it would be made to feel too new. Right. Because people don't want things to feel too new here. This shop has been here for 229 years. The last thing people want is it to be overly modernised. And, yeah. and it hasn't. It's just larger. A fresh lick of paint, maybe. Um, but not the, um, the black and chrome that people worried it would be. Right. And the right. coffee's better. <laughs> and the customers, the reaction from the customers has been good? Oh, it's largely positive. Um, it, it, entirely positive, to be honest. Um, yeah. I, I can't think of a bad word anyone has had to say, other than maybe not getting a seat in our busy times. <laughs> yeah, but there's there's far more seating now, but a, a lot of people have come to check it out since they know the refurb has um, taken place. Excellent. All right, so let's go through. We're going to give you both a chance to answer each of our, of our th uh, three questions, so we'll take them in turn. So, first of all, Halil, what do you like to, to drink with a cigar? What's your, uh, your, your drink of choice? I like a dark rum. Um, I feel like it really complements the cigar, um, especially with a dark, oily Maduro cigar. I think that goes really, really well with a cigar. And Nick, what's your uh, drink of choice? Depends a little on the cigar. If I'm going for something with a little age and light in body, a good stiff gin and tonic will do the job nicely. Right. Uh, however, rum, cognac has always been something that's worked really, really nicely. With something younger or something darker, never it doesn't hit the spot. 
Excellent. And so, Nick, again, we'll go back again. Uh, your favourite place to smoke a cigar? Either here or in my garden. Got it, yeah. yeah. Just out there, dressing gown on, laptop out there. <laughs> Good smoke, something to drink. Wonderful. Good times ahead. Any time of day. Yeah. <laughs> Great, excellent. We don't yeah. judge. <laughs> um, I like to smoke a cigar here. I love smoking a cigar here. I feel like I can interact with our customers as well. It makes our environment very informal, very relaxed, and that's what people like, and that's why people come here. Also, I like to smoke at home. Unfortunately, it has to be outside on our terrace because the wife doesn't let me smoke indoors. Right. Uh, but yeah, uh, the weather's started to get, the days are starting to get longer, so I'm sure I'll be smoking some nice cigars on my terrace. Mm. So there we are. So, so we're, we're filming this interview uh, in, in January. I only saw a note uh, earlier this week of somebody who, when the weather was warmer, saying they were sitting outside on their terrace in January smoking a cigar. So yeah, you can only just look forward to the, to the warmer days. So let's finish with your most memorable cigar, Halil. What's the, the, the cigar you remember best? My most memorable cigar, I was given a Davidoff Dom Perignon for my 31st birthday. It was sheer bliss of a cigar. It was an amazing cigar. Uh, an hour and a half of pure joy. It was a very smooth cigar, very tasty, um, and nothing like I've smoked before. That's a great cigar. To, 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 yeah, that's, I can imagine that's really memorable. And the, 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 the problem is there aren't many of them around to enjoy these days, unfortunately. There are fewer, not, yeah. fewer not, and fewer around. There's not many of them around. And I had the perfect surroundings. I was mm. with very, very close friends. And they happened to enjoy a nice cigar with me. So it was the perfect ambience as well. Nick, for you. I'd say the best cigar I've ever smoked was a... A 1961 Ramon Alonez private stock 82. Mind blowing in complexity. Uh, I've, I've been very lucky over years to smoke some fine, fine smokes, and it's just off the chart in every possible regard. A little cigar, uh, an ash was sort of three and a half or so inches on a, on a barely five inch cigar, and just sheer bliss. Very mild, but outrageously flavorful. Yeah, he heavy signature notes, but a, 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 a ton of underlying delicate qualities beyond that. Stunning. Well, gentlemen, that's been, it's been really great. It's been really nice to come here and see the lounge and to hear about the, the Masters of Banos. And, and uh, those who visit uh, Foxes will be able to know that the, that the two of you are two of the three of uh, the team here who got to the Master of Banos exam have passed and uh, they're in, uh, they'll be in good hands. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. much.